My name is Frank Hiley, and I, like she said, I'm a, a PhD in physics, but then I worked as a software engineer. In my retirement now, I'm writing a book, and the tentative title of that book is Spirituality Explained. So that's what I'm, I'm going to be talking about, the model of consciousness that explains spirituality. I won't talk much about the explaining of spirituality, but you can go to my website and find out more about that. So um, the first thing I'll talk about is agents and world models. And the definition of an agent is an agent is an entity that has goals, that has a way of sensing the world and a way of changing the world to try to achieve those goals. So by this definition, human beings are agents. We are agents. Now, a control system theory from 1970 says that every good regulator of a system must be a model of that system. A regulator is an agent. The system is the world where the agent is trying to achieve its goals. So this means that every good agent needs a model of the world. So again, since we're humans, we have a model of the world that we've constructed in our brain that models the world out there. Now, if the agent is part of the world, for example, my body here is part of this physical world where I'm trying to achieve my goals, I would need to include a model of my body in my model of the world, and that would be called a self-model. So it's the model of my body in the world is the self-model of, of the agent, and humans would have to have a self-model because we have bodies in the world. So I claim that we are not humans living in the world. We are really human self-models living in and experiencing our model of the world. For example, colors don't exist out in the real world. They only exist in our model of the world. So we are really living in our model of the world. And you can go to my website and see more evidence for this claim. Now I'm going to talk about the three-agent model. And the first agent of the three-agent model is the thinker. And the thinker is the general problem solver. It mostly works in the domain of concepts and, you know, Conceptual, conceptualizing problems and trying to sol solve problems using concepts. The doer is the agent that actually controls the body. It has complete control of the body. And then the experiencer is the agent that creates that world model that's required by the good regulator theorem. Now, the evidence for the thinker and doer is that they're consistent with experimentally derived and well-established models of cognition in two different fields. In the field of psychology here, it is consistent with dual process theory, Dual process theory was popularized by Daniel Kahneman in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. The fast is the, is the doer, that's system one, is the fast system. System two is the thinker, it's the slow system. It's also consistent with the, a model in neuroscience called the Action Outcome Stimulus Response Model. And in this case, the Action Outcome Contingency System is the system that's trying to figure out what action will produce the outcome that I want. So that's solving, solving problems. That's the problem, problem solver, the thinker. The sensory motor system and the, the stimulus, or re stimulus response habit system, that's the doer. So that's the evidence for the thinker and the doer. And then the experiencer is required by the good regulator theorem. So this is a model of the major connections between the agents. All of the inputs are on the left side of the screen here. All the outputs are on the right side of the screen. And the, the experiencer is the, is the agent that takes the sensory input from the world and it builds up the, the sensory model of the world. It also takes our language input and creates our conceptual model of the world. In fact, we live in a very abstract conceptual world a lot of the time. The, ex the experiencer also directs attention. And this can either be top-down attention, where the thinker and doer ask the experiencer to pay attention to something, or it can be bottom-up attention when the, th when the experiencer notices something that it thinks the thinker and doer might want to pay attention to, like a loud sound in this room. That would get your bottom-up attention to say, hey, what's going on with that sound? What should I do about it? Now, the experiencer also has all intuition, and it also has the goals and self-models of all four agents. There's the three agents you see here, but the human as a whole is the fourth agent. So there are four agents that you have to have self-models of. The thinker is the general problem solver, but it also produces thoughtful speech and thoughtful behavior, and it produces the inner thoughts and, and visualizations that we have in our head. The, the doer is the agent that controls the body, and it implements the thinker's uh, thoughtful behavior and thoughtful speech, but it also does its own automatic speech and automatic behavior that comes just from the doer. And the doer also produces all the feelings that we experience. And both the thoughts and the feelings are produced by the thinker and doer, but they're experienced by the experiencer over here. So now I'm going to talk about self-models, but I first have to st start with some definitions. I'm going to define I, me, my as a concept. That's my name for this concept. And it's the autobiographical narrative history of me. It's everything I know about me, and including a simple body model that the thinker thinks he controls. Then there's the body schema, 
which is a model of the body. So this, this is not the body itself, but it's the brain's model of the body. It's, it's, it's the knowledge about where all my arms and legs are and what they can do, the, the, what, they, what they're capable of. And there's, then there's a, a, a concept called the attention schema. Now the brain has a neurological attention mechanism where it's paying attention to something. That's not the attention schema. The attention schema is the brain's model of what that neurological mechanism is doing. So it's like a body schema is not the body, the attention schema is not the attention mechanism, but it's a model of the attention mechanism. Now remember that a self-model is needed if an agent is in the world that the agent is trying to, make, to, to, trying to achieve its goals in. Well, the thinker is in the conceptual world, it's trying to solve conceptual problems, so the self-model of the thinker is, is the I, me, my. The doer controls the body, so the self-model of the doer is the body schema. Now, you may think that the experiencer doesn't need a self-model because it isn't in the world doing things. It doesn't do things like the doer does. But I'll show you in, in the next few slides here that the attention schema is the experiencer self-model. And so I'm going to show you that by talking about world models. So there's a, I'm a physicist, so I believe there's a physical world out there. And then I have my model of the world. And this is apparently my model of the world because it has colors in it. And if you keep your eye on the center house there, so keep your eyes on that house only, don't move your eyes, but you can shift peripheral visual attention to the house to the right or to the house on the left there. And just keeping your eyes on the center house, it's hard because your eyes want to move to wherever you want to move the attention to, but it's possible to do that, to shift your peripheral attention around. So you can, you can have your eyes on the center house and your peripheral attention on the right or on the left or back to the center. Now when you did that, did the world change? No, I didn't experience the world changing when I shifted peripheral visual attention around. But what did change is what I call the current representation of the world, because that has the extra information that you get when you direct attention at an object. When you direct attention at an object, you get some extra information about that object, and then the thinker and doer can use that extra information to do something in the world. So the, the current representation of the world would shift like this when you move to the left, and then you move to the, to the right, or the right and left and backwards, and then back to the center. So let's consider these three objects here. We have the world model, which doesn't change when you shift attention. We have the attention schema, and then we have the current representation of the world. This, this is, you could call this the complete world object, because these are the three objects that the experiencer is creating. It's creating these three objects here. Now, what the experiencer does in this complete world object is it directs attention. And the model of what the experiencer is doing is exactly the attention schema. So this is the argument that the attention schema is the experiencer self-model in this complete world object here. Now we have attention schema theory, which tells us something else about attention schema. And this is a, a theory developed by a Princeton neuroscientist, Michael Graziano. And he, um, his claim is that the attention schema is a model of awareness. So, you know, awareness, that, that feeling that you're aware of something, that's really your attention schema, what you're experiencing there. And in particular, for an agent, he claims that the model of awareness for an agent is the agent's self-model plus the attention schema plus the current representation of the world. So if you're paying attention to a house, it would be the representation of the house in that current representation of the world. If the thinker had this model, uh, used this model here, it would be able to say, I, me, my, am aware of the house. So I'm aware of the house. That's what the thinker would say, um, talking about the awareness of the house. Now, if you notice here that the um, we said that the attention schema is the experiencer self-model, and attention schema theory says that the attention schema is also awareness. That means that awareness is really the experiencer's self-model. So we can fill out a model of the self-models of the agents here. The thinker self-model is the I, me, my. The doer self-model is the body schema. The experiencer self-model is awareness itself, and that's also known as attention schema. So just think about that. When you're aware of me talking or you're aware of, a, aware of a musical note, anything like that, any kind of awareness that you have, you are experiencing your experiencer's self-model. That awareness is the experiencer's self-model. Now, the human as a whole would be composed of some combination of self-models of these three agents here. I think of the human as having three slots, the, the amount of thinker I am, the amount of doer I am, and the amount of experiencer I am. And th those can change around with experience and with meditation and other kinds of practices that I'll talk about later. But th there's three slots in the, in, the, in, the, in the human as a whole, and it's going to be some combination of these three sub-agent self-models. Okay, now back to attention schema theory. This is the model of awareness. And according to attention schema theory, in order to have consciousness, you have to have an attention schema. 
but it's only the, the, only the um, experiencer has attention schema in this model. So that would say that only the experiencer is conscious. Of those three agents, only the experiencer is conscious. Now, to get conscious agents, you need to combine the experiencer with the other agents. So to get a doer consciousness, you've got to add the doer to the experiencer, and then you can have doer consciousness. To get thinker consciousness, you have to add the thinker to the experiencer, and then you can get thinker consciousness. And finally, the human consciousness would be some mixture of these other consciousness says, depending on the percentage of the self-models of each of those things in the, in the human. Now let's look at how each agent would experience objects in the world. So for example, the house. The thinker would say, I am aware of the house. The doer would have the body schema aware of the house, which is really the feeling of the body being aware of the house. This is the qualia that, that philosophers talk about, that feeling of what it feels like to be aware of something. That, that kind of a sense of feeling is coming from the doer. The experiencer would have awareness as the self-model, awareness as the attention schema, house. Now, these, this is not being aware of your awareness of the house. Both of these awarenesses are really of the house, which means that they're redundant. There's really only awareness of house. That's all we have here for the experiencer. This is a selfless awareness model here. There is no self for the experiencer. So when, when, when Buddhists say that there is no self, this is what they're experiencing. They're experiencing the world from the experiencer consciousness. That's where they say there is no self. And the non-dual people that say self-object, the self-object distinction has, has disappeared, they're experiencing it from this experiencer consciousness state. There's no self and no object because there's no self in this model here. So this is the, this is the experiencer consciousness. Now let's look at how these three agents would pay attention to their own awareness themselves. So now we've got the self-model plus the attention schema of the self-model. So the thinker would say, I'm aware of me. That's all the thinker can say. The doer would have the body being aware of the body. It's the quality experience of the body experiencing the body. That's the self-awareness of the doer. Now the experiencer would have awareness in all three slots here because it's the awareness is the self-model and it's, and it's what it's aware of. But these are all awarenesses pointing to themselves. So again, they're redundant. There is really just one awareness pointing to yourself. So this is a state that um, I think that advanced meditators call internal absorption. It's where you're, where you're paying attention to your own awareness and nothing else. That means you have no sensory experience outside in, from the outside world, no experience of your thoughts or your feelings. It's just awareness of awareness itself. It's also been described as a sense of presence because you exist, but it's not like you exist in the physical world. You're existing in this world of awareness. It's existing in that world, not in the physical world. So, so this, is, this is, again, something that I think is consistent with what enlightened people say they experience. Now let's look at some possible human self-models. And I'll start with, with non-human animals or ancient animals, ancient humans. And I claim that most animals have a doer-dominated consciousness. They, they, they identify with the body, and that's who they are. However, ancient humans, primates, dolphins, and elephants, I think have a significant amount of thinker consciousness built into there. It's not dominant, the doer is still dominant, but there's a significant amount of thinker consciousness. My evidence for this is that only these animals can pass the mirror self-recognition test. If you don't know what that is, look it up on Wikipedia. And I think you need to have a, a self-concept in order to pass that test. So that's my evidence that there's some thinker involved in these agents. Now, the normal modern human can either be a head-only type human, like Mr. Spock, or a head plus heart, like Dr. Kirk, or this could actually be me, and that could, that could be me, and that could be my wife. And then with, a, with ed meditation, you get more and more experience or self-model built in here, because meditation is about being aware of your awareness. That's what you're trying to do in meditation, is to concentrate on awareness and, and experience the awareness. And as you do that, you build up the fact that I am really about awareness is what I am. And that means that your self-model now contains awareness in here. So that's, that's, the, um, that's what happens with meditation. Now, another un unusual state of consciousness is the flow state. And it's usually described by these kinds of attributes here. And again, these are all consistent with the experiencer-dominated consciousness. The lack of self-consciousness, self that comes from the experiencer. The intense concentration on, on the now, that's what the experiencer does all the time. It's the thinker that's often the past or the future. And then there's the merging of action and awareness. And enlightened states of consciousness have similar attributes about selflessness and that sense of presence and the sense of no agency. Again, if you're, if you're identifying with the experiencer, 
you don't have a sense that you're doing anything because it's the thinker and the doer that are doing things in the world. They're, the experiencer isn't doing anything in the world. So there's no sense of agency if you have an experience of dominated consciousness. So the flow states and enlightened states would be something like this where you have less thinker, no thinker, and then it's 100% experiencer. That would be the fully enlightened state. So what you can see from all these diagrams is that there's really a continuum of states of consciousness. So in this triangle here, there's three axes where thinker consciousness, doer consciousness, and experiencer consciousness go from zero to 100. And any given human at any given point in time is at some point in this diagram here. And it can be dynamic. You can be in the normal state most of the time, but then when you happen to get into the flow state when you're working on something, you're moving over closer to the experiencer. And the whole idea of enlightenment is to try to spend more and more time up in this corner of the diagram here. So now let's look at what would happen if you took away one of these agents at a time from a human. So the, the, uh, if you took away the experiencer, I claim you would be unconscious. If there's no experiencer, you have no model of the world, yet you have no sensory inputs coming in because it all goes to the experiencer. The thinker and doer can't do anything because they need the, that model of the world that the experiencer creates, so you'd be unconscious. Now, without a doer, you would probably die because the doer controls breathing, but let's say you're on a ventilator so that you're still breathing. I claim that this is the same as the locked-in syndrome. In this state here, you're aware of all the sensory input coming in. You can see everything. You can hear everything. You can even think about everything with a thinker, but you can't move your body if you have no doer. So that's locked-in syndrome. So for a long time, I didn't know what it would be like to have no thinker. But just in the last uh, few months, I discovered there's this, this obscure neurological syndrome called autoactivation deficit syndrome. And I actually have a poster out there in the poster session about this particular syndrome here. So auto-activation deficit is a rare neurological system, uh, syndrome that comes from having specific kinds of focal damage to the basal ganglia. And it, it can't be extensive damage because you have a lot more defects than, than just this. So, so there's particular regions of the basal ganglia that have to be damaged by either carbon monoxide poisoning or a stroke or something like that. And if you get that kind of a damage, then you get into this auto-activation deficit condition. And there are three major symptoms of this condition, and I'll go through each of these symptoms on these next slides. So psychic akinesia it means that the patient can sit in, and not do, say, do anything and not say anything for hours and hours and hours. It can sit without, th without saying anything or doing anything. The most surprising thing is that this inertia is easily reversed if someone tells them to do something or if someone asks them a question. If you ask them a question, they'll answer it. If you tell them to go eat dinner, they'll get up and they'll go eat dinner. So some examples of this, this is all from the literature. I've got a bibliography that you can get a copy of. And you can get a copy of these slides by sending an email. I'll be happy to send you a copy of the slides. There was a, a patient whose son asked him to mow the lawn. So apparently he got his lawnmower out and then he got interrupted or something. And he stood there for 45 minutes with his hands on the lawnmower, not moving. When the son noticed this, he said, move. And when he said, when just that word move was all he had to say to then get up, get going and start moving, mowing the lawn. And he, could, he completed the lawn, I presume, it didn't tell me in this literature, and put the lawnmower away. So you don't need a thinker to mow the lawn, you just need a thinker to start mowing the lawn. Another patient sat for 30 minutes on his bed with an unlit cigarette in his mouth. When somebody asked him, what are you doing? He said, I'm waiting for a light. A patient who couldn't move without you asking him to do something. If you ask him to play bridge, he could play bridge. Now, this is an experienced bridge player, and I'm amazed that you can play bridge without a thinker, but apparently the, the experiencer has enough intuition to know what to bid and what cards to play, and the experiencer and the doer can go ahead and play a, a, a credible a game of bridge without getting the thinker involved at all. And another patient would only eat if told to eat, so the, uh, the wife said he would starve to death if I didn't tell him to eat. So those are all things that you, you have from the psyche akinesia. Now, the mental emptiness is that these patients report no thoughts and no projections into the future. Now, not all patients have this mental emptiness symptom. Some of them do have thoughts, and they can report about their thoughts. And, but, but even if you ask those patients, why are you sitting there not doing anything, they don't have an answer to that question. So it's not like the fact that you have no thoughts, that's why you're not moving anything. Even if you have thoughts, you may not move. Asked what he was thinking, a patient said, no, I'm not thinking, I'm just thinking of nothing, no idea, no question, no thought at all. Another one reported as being a blank in my mind. And then blunted affect means that the patients have reduced and short-lived um, emotions. 
When reminded of somebody who, who, who died, he, he, this patient cried sincerely, but then forgot about it. Another uh, patient was giving psychological, neuro, neuropsychological tests, and they would tell her when she passed them or when she failed them, and she was briefly pleased or disappointed when, when, you, when she got those results. So they do have emotions still, but they're just sub subdued emotions that don't last very long. And another patient reporting on the death of a nephew, she said, it was quite tragic, but now it's really not such a big deal. So the hypothesis is that a disabled thinker explains all of these symptoms. So the one thing the thinker would, would do is would ask the question, what should I do or say now? If there is no thinker to address that question, then the doer is just going to sit there patiently waiting for the thinker to tell it what to do or say. Or the next thing the thinker might think is, what should I think about now? If there's nothing to do or say right now, I'm, I can still think about something. If there, again, there was, if there's no thinker activated, then that would explain the symptom of mental, mental emptiness. Now, how do patients answer questions? I claim that they answer the question by the doer doing an automatic answer. So the question comes into the experiencer, the experiencer knows what the answer is, it tells the doer the answer, and the doer automatically says the answer. And in fact, I hope that most of my, my talk here is by my doer, because if my thinker gets involved, I'm going to be uh, hesitating and not sure what to say next and things like that. So automatic speech is the, is most of our speech is automatic speech. And similarly, um, the doer treats the request to do something as if it came from the absent thinker. So that's why these patients are able to do things when somebody asks them to do them. And apparently, the doer can do things like mow lawns and play bridge all by itself. It doesn't need a thinker to do those kinds of things. Now, blunted affect, remember the, the patient who talked about her nephew, how it's not such a tragic thing now. If they, if they had a, a, a thinker going on, that thinker would amplify and prolong the feeling of sadness about that nephew's death. It would say things like, oh, this is terrible. My poor sister, how is she going to handle this? Why did he have to die? What a terrible disease. He had such a bright future, and that can go on and on and on and amplify and prolong that feeling of sadness about the nephew's death. That's the devastation that comes from having a thinker. So without the amplification, the sadness dissipates quite quickly. So, so th some things I learned about, um, about this model from this condition is that it's surprising how little the thinker is needed. It's mainly needed to initiate actions. I mean, yes, you need it to solve transcendental equations and you know, whatever else you're doing in math or physics, but in ordinary life, the main thing you need the thinker for is to initiate actions, or to initiate uh, thinking, or to initiate speech. And I also think this is a good piece of additional evidence for my three-agent model, the fact that this can explain this condition, which I never had in mind when I created this three-agent model. And finally, AAD has some similarities to enlightened states. For example, the blunted affect is like having no attachments and no aversions, which is what the Buddhists are, are, are striving for. And no thoughts is another thing that, that a lot of people report in enlightened states. Now, the difference, thing, the difference is that enlightened people still do have a thinker, and so they can still initiate actions and motions. But there's also a lot of enlightened people that just kind of go off by themselves and don't do much in the world. So that could be kind of like the psychic kinesis. But um, it's, you know, these people are disabled. They would die without people around them. So this is not the same thing as enlightenment at all. Finally, I get some testable predictions from this. Uh, I claim an AAD patient would never be able to learn how to play bridge because you need your thinker a lot when you're learning. But they would, so they would never be able to do something like that. Also, in dual process theory, the way that they demonstrate the thinker versus the doer in dual process theory is by giving them a multiple choice question where the intuitive answer is the wrong answer. And so I claim that these AAD patients would always give you the intuitive answer. They wouldn't think through and figure out what the correct answer is. Now, it turns out that 80% of people give the wrong intuitive answer. That's how they know about dual pro the, the two agents in dual process theory. Most of the time, we're lazy, and we just go with the intuitive answer. So that's, my, that's another prediction. So in... Uh, oh, I'm over my time, but I hope that your experiencer intuitively understood this explanation of consciousness. And thanks for directing your top-down attention to my, attend my uh, talk. Here's the list of bibliography. And again, send me an email. I'll send you all the slides and the list of all that. And please check out my website and, and sign up for updates. When I finally publish the book, I'll send you an email telling you that the book has been published so you can get a copy.